Oh, okay, folks, so I want to read another chapter here from The Last President. It was published on the Library of Congress. Copyright September 28, 1896. I'll put a link in the description and in the playlist description for this e-book. And we left off uh, with chapter 8. Oh, zoom in just a little bit. Chapter 8. The fateful year of 99, upon its coming in, found the Republic of Washington in dire and dangerous straits. The commercial and industrial boom had spent its force, and now the frightful evils of a debased currency, coupled with the demoralizing effects of rampant paternalism, were gradually strangling the land to death. Capital, ever timid and distrustful in such times, hid itself in safe deposit vaults, or fled to Europe. Labor, although really hard-pressed and lacking the very necessities of life, was loud-mouthed and defiant. Socialism and anarchism found willing ears into which to pour their burning words of hatred and malevolence, and the consequence was that serious rioting broke out in the larger cities of the North often taxing the capacities of the local authorities to the utmost. It was brooded abroad that violent dissensions had arisen in the cabinet. The young president, giving signs of a marked change of mind, and like many of man who has appealed to the darker passions of the human heart, he seemed almost ready to exclaim, I stand alone. The spirits I have called up are no longer obedient to me. My country, oh, my country, how willingly would I give my life for thee, if by such a sacrifice I could restore thee to thy old-time prosperity. <laughs> for the first he began to realize what an intense spirit of sectionalism had entered into this revolutionary propaganda. He spoke of his fears to none, save to his wise and prudent helpmate. I trust you, beloved she whispered, as she pressed the broad, strong hands that held her and clasped. Eh, dear one, but does my country? Came in almost a groan from the lips of the youthful ruler. Most evident was it that thus far the South had been the great gainer in this struggle for power. She had increased her strength in the Senate by six votes. She had regained her old-time prestige in the House. One of her most trusted sons was in the speaker's chair, while another brilliant Southron led the administration forces on the floor. Born as she was for the brilliant exercise of intellectual vigor, the South was of that strain of blood which knows how to wear the kingly graces of power so as best to impress the common people. Many of the men of the North had been charmed and fascinated by this natural pomp and inborn demeanor of greatness and had yielded to it. Not a month had gone by that this now dominant section had not made some new demand upon the country at large. Early in the session, as its request, at its request, the internal revenue tax which had rested so long upon the tobacco crop of the South and poured so many millions of revenue into the national treasury was wiped from the statute books with but a feeble protest from the North. But now the country was thrown into a state bordering upon frenzy by a new demand, which, although couched in calm and decorous terms, nay, almost in the guise of a petition for long-delayed justice to hard-pressed and suffering brethren, had about it a suppressed yet unmistakable tone of conscious power and imperiousness, which well became the leader who spoke for that glorious Southland to which the Union owes so much of it great, its greatness and its prestige. <laughs> Said he, Mr. Speaker, for nearly 30 years our people, although left impoverished by the conflict of the states, have given up their substance to salve the, salve the wounds and make green the old age of the men who conquered us. We have paid this heavy tax, this fearful blood money, unmurmuringly. <laughs> Interesting word. Unmurmuringly. You have forgiven us for our bold strike for liberty that God willed should not succeed. 
You have given us back our rights. Open the doors of these sacred halls to us. Called us your brothers. But unlike noble Germany, who was content to exact a lump sum from La Belle France and then bid her go in peace and freedom from all further exactions, you have for nearly 30 years laid this humiliating war tax upon us and thus forced us year in and year out to kiss the very hand that smote us. Are we human that we now cry out against it? Are we men that we feel no tingle in our veins after these long years of punishment for no greater crime than that we loved liberty better than the bonds of a confederation laid upon us by our fathers? We appeal to you as our brothers and our countrymen. Lift this infamous tax from our land, than which your great north is 10,000 times richer. Do one of two things. Either take our aged and decrepit soldiers by the hand and bless their last days with pensions from the treasury of our common country, for they were only wrong in that their cause failed. Or remove this hated tax and make such restitution of this blood money as shall seem just and equitable to your soberer and better judgment. To say that this speech, of which the foregoing is but a brief extract, threw both House of Congress into most violent disorder, but faintly describes its effect. Cries of treason, treason went up. Blows were exchanged, and hand-to-hand -hand struggles took place in the galleries, followed by the flash of the dread bowie and the crack of the ready pistol. The Republic was shaken to its very foundations. Throughout the North, there was but a repetition of the scenes that followed the firing upon Sumter. Public meetings were held, and resolutions passed, calling upon the government to concentrate troops in and about Washington and prepare for the suppression of a second rebellion. But gradually, this outbreak of popular indignation lost some of its strength and virulence, for it was easy to comprehend that nothing would be gained at this stage of the matter by meeting a violent and unlawful demand with violence and unwise counsels. Besides, what was it anyway but the idle threat of a certain clique of unscrupulous politicians? The Republic stood upon too, a, too firm a foundation, excuse me, the Republic stood upon too firm a foundation to be shaken by mere appeals to the passions of the hour. To commit treason against our country called for an overt act. What had it to dread from the mere oretical flash of a passing storm of feeling? They really used interesting words back then, huh? It is hard to say what the young president thought of these scenes in Congress. So pale had he grown of late that a little more of pallor would pass unnoted. But those who were, those who were, won't to look upon his face in these troublous times report that in the short space of a few days, the lines in his countenance deepened perceptibly, and that a firmer and stronger expression of willpower lurked in the corners of his wide mouth, overhung his square and massive chin. And, and accentuated the vibrations of his wide-opened nostrils. He was under a terrible strain. When he had caught up the scepter of power, it seemed a mere bauble in his strong grasp, but now it had grown strangely heavy, and there was a mysterious pricking in, at his brow, as if that crown of thorns which he had not willed should be set upon the heads of others were being pressed down with cruel hands upon his own. We he definitely used some interesting, very descriptive type of words, huh? Yeah. Anyway, that's chapter eight. Do chapter nine another time.